Thanks, Brett, and, uh, and thank you all. It's been a full couple of days for you, um, and to have you here uh, towards the back end of things, uh, it, it is a privilege for me to be standing in front of you and speaking to you about something that I think is, um, is really, really important to coaching. Um, we're judged on our feet. When we stand up and we speak to people, it's a judging space. It's a space where people will make assumptions about you. It's a space where your intention as a coach becomes obvious to the world when you stand and you speak to other people. And so it's a space that you need to get right. And so this notion of speaking well to other people, of speaking with impact, uh, is a really, really important um, part, I believe, of coaching. I, my coaching uh, role is in executive coaching. It's not in the technical coaching and the sort of sports coaching area that you do. So you will have to make some, some leaps in as you listen uh, uh, to contextualize some of the things I say. My, my background, though, is quite different even to coaching. My background was in education. And if you'd spoken to me um, seven years ago, not that long ago, you would have been speaking to a school principal. That's what I did. My whole career up to that point was in education, uh, leading schools and as a teacher in the first instance. There are probably lots of you in the room here who have been teachers or are teachers currently. And my, my footsteps from there to here really came from a question that my eldest son asked me one day. My eldest son, Kieran, came home from university one day and he said, Dad, can I ask you a question? And uh, I said, sure, mate, pull, you know, pull up a chair. What do you want to know about life? You know, the usual dad thing. Phil out of modern family. Pull up a chair. Uh, and his question was, Dad, um, I, I have a lot of fun in my life, he said, but I don't think I have a lot of joy. And his question was, what can you tell me about the difference? I have a lot of fun in my life, Dad, but I don't really think I have a lot of joy. What can you tell me about the difference? Now, you know you're in trouble, don't you? <laughs> Those of you who are parents, you're in strife when you get a question like that. I mean, we're supposed to be bringing them up. Um, but here he was, sitting in front of me, a first world question. You know, if we were in Syria, we'd be settling for fun, probably. But <laughs> nevertheless, I have a lot of fun in my life, but I don't have a lot of joy. What do you know about the difference? I said, oh, jeepers, Kieran, um, mate, I don't even know if I hear your question properly. You need to tell me some more. And he said, in his own words, he said, if you look at the outside of me, Dad, um, he said, I think everything looks okay. I'm doing fine in uni. I'm, um, I've got lots of friends, enjoy my sport, go to the pub. You know, the things that make a 19-year-old look okay. He says, I think if you look at the circumference of me, I think you would say I'm fine. But he said, I never feel quiet. I never feel peaceful, uh, and I'm calling that joy. And then he said something that almost broke my heart. He said, um, is this just being 19, and is it just being an adult? Is becoming an adult a process of settling for less? And is the idea that you can live with joy a childish idea? Or is it possible to be a man in the world and to be joyful? Uh, the truth of, uh, of this boy, you know, was that I didn't know him. He'd grown up for 19 years in my house. Uh, and yet, and yet, and yet, I'd stopped looking at him. I don't know what stage I'd stopped looking at him. So I said to him, um, so Kieran, just give me a sense of what do you mean by joy? When you say that word, what's your, what does that mean? Like, how do you know joy exists? He says, because I've experienced it, Dad. I know what joy feels like. And he said, when I was 12 and 13, for example, he said, you used to have time, you know, the parent being slayed here, you used to have time still to take me out uh, on the Bibbulmun track. It's, I live in Western Australia, in spite of my accent. I've been there for, since 1988, so I know it sounds like I got here yesterday. Uh, but um, he said, you used to have time to take me out on the Bibbulmun track. And we'd walk for a day, we'd walk for two days with our packs on our backs. And at the end of a day's walk, we'd throw our bags down, light up a fire, and we'd sit on a log and just have a dodgy cup of tea. And he said, 
We weren't talking about stuff. It wasn't a big Proustian discussion, big philosophical thing. We were just sitting alongside each other. He says, and I always knew sitting there that life can come down to some fairly straightforward, simple things. There's a few things that matter more than other things. Not everything matters the same. And he said, I don't feel that much anymore. I feel I'm always busy. I feel I'm always rushed. I feel I'm always stressed in some ways. I feel I'm always trying to achieve something. And he says, I'm not sure if that's just normal or if there's anything I can do about that. And that's what I want to talk about. The man he was talking to, me, uh, in that moment, basically, my, I, I basically made a decision to stand up and step out of my, my working life and do something else. Because the question that he was asking me when I applied that question to myself was, um, what's the world seeing from you? Who's turning up for work every day? I was turning up for work every day with a face like an Easter Island statue. Right? Now, I was saying all the right stuff. Like, if you looked at the outside of my principalship, all my metrics were fine. You know, my reviews were fine. People would have said I was, probably would have said I was a good principal. I, I hope they would have said I was a good principal. Parents were in good shape. Kids were fantastic. Nothing wrong from the circumference. But the truth of me was that I felt like an imposter. I felt like I was dragging myself through my days. I felt like life was grinded out. You know, trudging in treacle, just getting it done, getting to the end of the week, getting to the end of the year, getting to the end of, you know, whatever. As I began to think about it and read about it, I realized I had this thing called the imposter syndrome, this, this sense that where I was actually, guys, we've all got two modes of work in us, roughly speaking. We've all got a high performance mode. We've got a mode where when we're working in it, it's hard work, but we love it. It gives us life. It gives us purpose. It gives us meaning. And we've got another mode of work in us, which I'm going to call grinded out, which is just getting stuff done expectations, doing the stuff that everybody else thinks is important, not necessarily that you think you're, is important yourself. And, and there's always both modes available to us. My, my, in applying the 80-20 principle, I was 80% grinding it out. 80% of my days, 80 out of 100 days, were just getting through the day, grinding it out. 20% was a bit of joy there. 20% was a bit of flourishing, a bit of joy, a bit of purpose, a bit of meaning, a bit of, a bit of life, a bit of fire, passion. Some of the things we've been talking about this week. But 80% of the time, what was turning up for work was somebody who had felt, really, who was living a version of himself that the rest of the world was waiting for and expecting. But it really wasn't true to who I was. I had a coach at the time. Coaches are great people. Um, I had a coach at the time, and I went to my coach, and I said, you know, my son has asked me this question, and we're working through. By the way, on the personal level, it was easy to address. Like, Kieran and I walk three times a year now, again. He's 25, he's an engineer, and he still gets joy, and I do too. And, and there are times, and my youngest son, Ronan, who's 19, uh, he walks with us now. And there are times when I watch those two boys, much fitter than me, you know, flying over the top of a hill with a pack on their back, and when I watch those boys, and the sun will catch them as they cross the hill, and I literally, you know, big soft bloke that we all are, uh, if we're blokes, uh, um, I have tears in my eyes. They're tears of gratitude that he had the courage to ask me the question, right? Because it wasn't that hard to find myself back there again. I was making excuses not to be on the log. That's an excuse. I, didn't, I, I could get back there, and I got back there. So that's... You know, I managed to address that pretty quickly. The career, the business, the work side of things was a different question. And I went to my coach and I said, you know, my son has asked me this question. And I said, it's really floored me because I think I'm deformed. I think I'm living off my own purpose. I think who I am in the world, what I'm good at in the world, what I love to do in the world, what gives me life and what I can give life into the world through is not what I'm doing most days. I think I'm living a different version of myself. I'm living, I'm not sure what I'm doing. You know, I, I'm 57. This is, I, was, I was about 50 years of age at the time. So maybe there's something about half a century that might have thrown me into this uh, existential tailspin. And the coach said to me, he said, so Brendan, what does give you life? Like, you know, what gives you purpose? What gives you life? What gives you joy? And I said, after a process of talking it through, I sort of ended up saying, when I was 18, 19, I decided to be a teacher. I decided that it would be a good thing to give your life to the moment when learning opens up between people. I love the moment when learning opens up, when people genuinely connect, 
and when real learning happens between people. And he said, why did you leave that to become a headmaster and a systems person and all that? Why did you leave that? And I said, oh, money, promotion, status, all sorts of other, you know, all the reasons we all make decisions in our lives. Uh, and he said, well, how do you get back there? And I said, I don't know if I can get back there. He said, well, let's talk about that. And then through a process of good coaching over probably three or four months, um, he led me to see, or he allowed me to see, I don't know whether a coach leads you or allows you, I think the best coaches allow you to see what you already know, um, but he allowed me to see that, uh, that I needed to stand up, I needed to straighten up, and I needed to take a different path with my career. Um, to bring myself back to, what I set out was to do was to change the proportionality from 20% joy and 80% grinded out, I set myself the challenge, in five years' time, could I be 80% joy and 20% grinded out? Is that possible? And thankfully, it has been. So I set up my own sort of business and so on, and you know, without sort of going through all the ins and outs of that, that business has ended up le leading me to, he to you, standing here in front of you today. Because of the power of a question and because of our capacity as human beings to stand up to take that seriously and to do things differently. I tell you the story at the start of this presentation. It was meant to be a workshop. We're far too many people here for a workshop, but I've got a couple of little handouts at the end if anybody wants one. Um, I tell the story because I want to walk towards you. When you're speaking to other people, it's not their job to, you know, it's not their job to walk to you. You've got to make an attempt to walk to them. And I tell the story because it opens me up. Because it's a sacred story out of my own life. And because it changes my body language when I'm speaking to you. I've watched myself tell that story on camera. And my arms are different. And my stance is different. And my eyes are different. And my voice is different. Because when you're speaking from something that you care about and that is sacred to you and precious to you and real to you, you look different, you sound different, and you feel different. And that changes your capacity to speak with some impact. It's difficult because once upon a time we were all prey. Like, I'm the most vulnerable man in the room right now. Like, this is a vulnerable space. You, you, uh, who am I telling, right? You're experienced coaches. You're, you're, you're probably very, very good in this space yourselves. But you know that this is vulnerable space. Because from an evolutionary point of view, everything has told us not to stand out. We don't like being in this vulnerable space. We feel judged. We feel like we can be imposters. And we feel, oh, I'd love to be sitting down at the back just, you know, chilling out, watching something happen rather than being the one who has to make it happen. Once we were prey and everything in us doesn't, like, you know, whether you're, some people think they're show ponies, most of us don't really want to draw attention to ourselves. It's not in our, and that's the, that's the zebra that got caught, was the one who stood out. You don't want to be the zebra that gets caught. You know, so uh, uh, by instinct, uh, in our evolutionary sense, through our, uh, all our chemical and hormonal reactions, are really, um, are really telling us to blend in. Blend in and stay safe. And yet, when you take a leadership role, when you take a speaking role, when you take a stance in front of other people of any kind, you're actually working against that and saying, well, here I am. For what it's worth, guys, for who I am, just as I am, here I am. And that's difficult for us to do. And we need to practice it, and we can get better at it. If you get stressed, and it's been alluded to a few times this week, if you get stressed, your fight and flight hormones take over, your hormones take over. And, and we revert to fairly sort of, you know, your governing values under stress could be to defend yourself. You know, you will literally hide your heart when you're not safe with people. We literally hide our heart. You'll do all sorts of things with your hands and with your body to actually hide your heart when you're not safe. When you're safe, and I watched Stephen yesterday, who was obviously very safe with us because Stephen's hands were showing his heart all the time. And in fact, when Stephen spoke about himself, he put his hand on his heart. You know, we're, we're creatures. Uh, and our governing values under stress, if you're put up in front of people and you're not prepared and you're not ready for it, 
or you're not in the right emotional or energy field for it, uh, your governing values, you could become a bully, you could become cutting, you can become a coward, you can become all sorts of things when you're put under pressure in front of people. And so we avoid the situation typically. I don't want to give you a recipe for this, guys, because there isn't a recipe. Anybody who thinks there are recipes for complex things is an idiot. Um, you know, there aren't recipes for this, but there are useful approaches. No, here are the five steps to speaking with impact. Anybody read, if you see that book, don't buy it. It's just not real. It's not real. You know, there are different rules and different circumstances, and all of you as experienced coaches know this. You know, what worked on a Monday may not work on a Tuesday. What worked with that player may not work with that player. The rules are what works. The rules are context. The rules are drawing from what you know to be possible for that athlete, for that team, under the circumstances that you meet them. So, you know, the old saying, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Uh, you can have the most beautiful plan for things in the world, but the moment you meet the reality, the truth of the thing, that whole plan is gone. You're on your own, and you've got to have, you know, useful approaches is what I want to offer you this morning or this afternoon, useful approaches. It is morning for me where I come from, five hours, uh, five hours back. I want you, just for a second, I want to speak to you for 45 minutes. Uh, um, the research on this, by the way, is that about 12 minutes you can speak to people. After that, Elvis leaves the building, uh, if Elvis was even in the building in the first place, right? So, you know, unless you find yourself really, really interesting, uh, after about 12 to 14 minutes, you should give people a chance to have a quick buzz. I want you to think briefly about a presentation that had significant uh, impact on you this weekend, it, or just a little piece of a presentation. Um, just think about who impacted you, what impacted you for a second. I'll ask you to talk to the person next to you in a moment. Um, and I just want you to think about one or two things that you think, I think she got through to me because of this, or I think what he said to me impacted on me because of this. So just call one of those to your mind for a moment, and then just for a couple of minutes, just share that with the person next to you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll lay a sort of a metric across it to see if we can capture your experience with the, and I've got a, a handout on this one if anybody finds it useful. So just for a moment, um, and, and then have a quick conversation with the person next to you, what's impacted you and why? Just holding that for a moment, You've seen a series of presentations this week, um, and you've had a little conversation about a couple of the things that have impacted you from those smorgasbord of presentations. I'm sure many of you use TED Talks, and look at TED Talks, it's a great resource, uh, TED Talks, they're about everything, um, and when you see a TED Talk, it's only 18 minutes, and um, really usually pretty well crafted speaking with impact opportunity. Um, Carmen Gallo has written a book called Talk Like Ted, and he has distilled what happens in a great TED Talk into nine secrets. And I just want you to continue your conversation by, one, uh, did, you, did you mention, did you name, did you come to the conclusion that something impacted you because of any of these nine reasons? Um, I don't like reading out slides, guys, but this, the print on that one's a bit small. The first one is that they speak from passion. That's unleash the master within. Okay, there is a handout if anybody really wants this one. It's a useful little one to, to help you craft a, a public speech. The first one in at the very center is unleash the master within. I won't say the mistress within. Um, uh, not because I don't want to be gender equal, but because it wouldn't sound right. The second one is master the art of storytelling. You know, find little stories. Find where Stories put us in our pajamas. Stories are really, really transporting for us as human beings. The third one is be conversational. The times have changed, guys. The formal thing is gone. I mean, if I had my way, I'd be standing down the floor here. This is the formal sort of speech, um, you know, things we learned about that, that. The world is less formal now. So we want to be more conversational. Um, teach me something new. Human beings love to learn something. They love to be twisted. They love to just, you know, they love to be dis disconfirmed in some of the things they think about. Deliver a, a jaw-dropping moment. Surprise me. You know, hit me with something that I wasn't expecting. Lighten up, you know, stop taking yourself so seriously, um, you know, stick to the 18-minute rule, that's a TED rule, I mean, even if you have to do lots of talking, make sure you're never talking for longer than, I, I think, 12 to 15 minutes, if you're working with young people, that's even a long stretch, um, young people find it hard to stay on, uh, because they're screenagers now, they flick, they flick, and they flick you um, as quickly as they flick anything else. Um, 
It was a young person that asked me the question between fun and joy, though. So I'm not a person who believes that our young people have gone to the dogs. I think it's the other way around in some ways. I think they have a lot to teach us. But anyway, um, paint mental pictures. As human beings, we're actually more visual, like paint mental pictures. Give us images. Give us metaphors. Uh, and stay in your lane. If you're going to talk about something, talk about something you know something about. Don't get so cocky up there that you think, oh, my, now that I'm here, I might tell you this as well. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the brain science of things. You go, oh, you you're not a brain scientist. Please don't talk about that. Um, like, talk about something you know and stay in your lane. So just, again, finish off your conversation for, few, for you know, 30 seconds or a minute. The time is, is fairly tight for us today. Was there anything in those, are there, is there anything in those nine that actually explained why you picked that uh, presentation? Is it, is it in that space that, uh, that you were responding to those people? Okay, so Jen, another minute. Just have a quick chat with the person next to you. Okay, okay, okay. Some things work and some things don't. Some things connect groups of people and some things don't. Some things disconnect groups of people. You know, we're, we, as a leader of any kind, as a coach or as a leader of any kind, what your job is, you know, you can, we can define it a million different ways, but in many ways leadership is orchestrating human energy to a purpose. You, you know, the energy of the group is available you're the leader of the group, we orchestrate that energy to a purpose. Um, even like this conversation here today, like there's an enormous amount of wisdom and energy in the room here, and it's partly my job to orchestrate this to a purpose. Okay? I'm really interested in this whole notion of energy because how you put your energy in front of a group of people will have a large um, bearing on whether or not some learning happens or whether or not some outcomes uh, are achieved. And I don't think we often think about our stance and our energy and how do we put our energy in front of a group of people. Like who turns up in front of your people? When you turn up to teach them something, when you turn up to coach something, when you turn up to speak to them with some impact, who is there and is your energy fully available to them and are you in the right space for that interaction? So I want to look at that. I mean, you, uh, if we had time to workshop this, and this is sort of uh, a part of, a, of a, a full day that we do with, with carded coaches, um, if I asked you, when you're in your own practice, when you've spoken with impact, when you know you've cut through, when you know you've stood up, you've taken your stance, and what you've had to say has mattered to people and has made a difference, if we were to ask you to list the things that um, made that possible, what are the pillars of your own practice, you could do that very easily. Um, when I ask myself the same question, uh, in my practice, these are the four pillars that I, and I have a nice little acronym called EPIC. Um, I get my emotions right, my energy, um, en emotion is energy in motion. I get my emotional state right, because I feel safe when I'm speaking well. I feel safe, I don't feel threatened and vulnerable. I get myself emotionally into the right space. That's actually the first and most important preparation. The second one is just literally your preparation. Are you clear on what you're trying to say? Have you got a message that you're trying to give or are you all over the shop, unprepared? So I wanna look at those two, emotion and preparation. When you give people a chance to interact, 
and, and, and build interest through interaction. That has a big bearing on it for me. And finally, when you genuinely connect with other people. When, when the people in the room feel like you're talking to them, not to the group. When you actually feel, when people feel you're talking to them, however unlikely and improbable that can feel like in a big group like this, um, you've built some connection. They actually, they see you as a person and they listen to you as people. Uh, and something real happens. And I mean, we saw in that first session this morning something real happening where people were trying to get belo below the surface interaction to a more real interaction. So just looking at that first one, emotional preparation, what I have to feel, like I have to feel that, you know, you know I, was I looking forward to standing up in front of you this morning and talking? No. Um, it's not what you want to do. I'd love to be sitting down listening. But I have to feel safe to do it well. I have to actually feel that nothing is personal. Brendan, you're just standing in front of good people. And a, you know, you're a good man in front of good people. And a good man and good people will make good sense together. Trust that. Trust the others. Uh, you have to feel that it's not personal. For me, I literally, because a lot of my work now tends to be in the sort of lean into the space of wisdom, I literally have to say a little bit of a mantra to myself. Here's my transitional space, guys. Before we all started to, before I started to speak, I was here. And when I was about to speak to you, I knew I had to come to here. And in that liminal space, in that transition space, to get my energy right, uh, to feel like I can be as respectful of you as I can be and as respectful to myself as I can be, I need to say what, I, what, what my mantra is, I will say nothing new here, and it's not coming from me anyway, and there's any truth in what I say, it'll be because you hear it and not just because I say it. And that little statement, mantra, phrase, that may not be one that would work for you, but something uh, helps me to prepare my energy to stand in front of you with poise and possibility and to be genuinely open to, to your wisdom and your genius and, and, and your worth. I think we don't prepare ourselves that well often in that liminal space, in that thresh threshold crossover space. I think we just stand up to speak. And we do all the preparation that I'll talk about next, but we don't do that bit of emotional preparation. And if you're not okay, it won't be okay. It's a critical message that I'm trying to get across here in this, in this short sort of workshop. If you're not okay, it won't be okay, because everything depends on how you are. Your message will transact, your, your words will transact your heart and your intention. And the only way your words will transact your heart and intention is if you feel safe and well. Um, the good news is that people want you to succeed. You know, I've already picked out a number of you, and you've given me beautiful energy. Just given me just eye contact and a nod or a smile. And it's, you know, people want us to do okay. People actually want us to succeed. Is there the odd toster in the world? Of course there is. Right, there is the odd person out there, and they wake up in the morning, and I'm sure when they're washing their teeth, they're working out whose life they're going to make miserable for the day. But they're rare, really, and uh, we shouldn't pander to that. The majority of people want it to be okay for you. They, they, they have that, we have those mirror neurons. We know what it feels like to be up here, and we want the person to be okay. The, the best thing I can tell you to do is to study yourself closely. We're not great at this in our cultures. In Australia or in New Zealand, we, we, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much in our cultures. Um, it's the same in Ireland, uh, but we've got nothing to get ahead of. So, um, <laughs> um, When I work with rugby in New Zealand, they sent me a clip. I don't know if the rugby guys are here. They sent me a, they sent me the USB with the work on it after the day. And to watch yourself work in this sort of space is the most instructive thing you can do. Especially, I'll, I'll talk to you about what to watch for in a moment, but to watch yourself work in this sort of space is the most instructive thing you can do. You can have feedback all you want, and it's great. You can think about it all you want, and it's great, but actually watch yourself. And I've got to the point now where I watch myself with the sound off. You might say, yeah, good idea, mate. Um, watch yourself with the sound off, and watch where your hands are. Watch where your eyes are. Watch where your feet are. And every now and again, when you see something odd, stop it and say, what was I doing there? That was beautiful. I was really open there. Or I'm, f I'm terrified there, or I'm all over the place there. Watch and turn on the sound then and say, ah, when I'm in that situation, it's, it's difficult for me, and I shut down. Or when I'm telling a story, I open up, 
when you watch yourself, get clips of yourself teaching, coaching, and watch it, because it's the most powerful thing you can do. And when you're watching it, watch, did you find touchstones? Did you find people in the room who give you good energy? If you find a, if you find a millstone, you know, the guy who, I was going to say sits down in the back, but I don't want to say that, because there's people down in the back, but if, you know, the, the person who gives you this, right? He's like a big black hole in the room. You can give him everything you want, and nothing's coming back. Um, his job is to, 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 he's an energy anchor, right? And he's like that at work usually, you know? He's, everybody else has to look after him and lift him all the time. He's like a flat tire. Uh, all the other tires have to keep, keep the, to keep the car moving. So literally, pick out some people early in a group when you're working and pick out some touchstones that give you good energy because you'll feed off that. If you feed off the other energy, it'll drag you down there. You'll down spiral into that space. Find some touchstones. Every conversation is two conversations. Every communication is two conversations. Uh, uh, this, the spoken and the gestured. Right? So from the time we were little children, we were attuned to gesture. You're attuned to faces. I'm attuned. We're attuned to each other's faces and we're attuned to each other's bodies. So to think that what we say is what people are hearing is to miss the fact that they're hearing that and they're hearing the gesture. And in fact, when the two are out of sync, you'll probably know people pay more attention to gesture than they do to the spoken word. So if you're terrified, and if you're hiding your heart, and if your hand is up here, and you're, you're doing this sort of stuff, people are actually picking that up. Doesn't matter how beautiful your words are, people are not getting a beautiful experience. So every conversation is, uh, every communication is two, and gesture always trumps the spoken. So when you're watching yourself, watch, this is the point about having the sound off, watch yourself physically. Watch your physicality. Watch how well you're covering the room. Watch the speed you're walking, whether you're walking, whether you're stuck behind a barrier all the time, etc., etc. Watch your eyes, because your eyes, the windows to your soul, and your eyes, you know, you can't fake it. The eye, people will see you, people, people can tell, you can tell when you're really there with people. Watch the eyes, watch the feet. Remember that you'll have an anchor point and work out where it tends to be. I mean, I, I, because of the dynamics today, my anchor point is here. Typically, my anchor point in a group of people would be more likely to be quite slightly off to the side, but you will actually have an anchor point, which is a place where you'll go back to to feel safe. But it's also a place where the people can expect you to speak from. You know, when you've had a buzz and you call them back from a buzz, they'll expect you to be in that spot. So make sure you understand you will have an anchor point. Work out where it is. Work out the importance of pause. Um, if you pardon the horrendous pun. Um, silence is connective, not disconnective. You know, there are some things that connect us as human beings. Story connects us. Humor connects us. Questions connect us. Um, humility connects us. Silence connects us. Don't be afraid of it. And make sure that when you're speaking, if you really want to speak with impact, that you are quiet now and again. It has a huge effect on a group. If it lasts too long, <laughs> they'll start to worry about you. Uh, and we're not a silent culture anymore. We're a very busy, we're a very fast-moving culture now. So, you know, try to find a phrasing, a pausing in your steps and a phrasing, a pausing in your words as well. Because uh, an enormous amount of learning is done in the quiet moment between words, not just from the words themselves. So I wonder how conscious are you about how you show up? You're a coach. You're obviously, you're, you know, a lot of very successful people sitting in the room here. How conscious are you about who shows up in front of the group? This guy probably thinks he's an eagle or something. Um, but he's a fairly ravaged, plucked emu, or whatever he is. Let's have a quick look at preparation. Um, I mean, the times have changed. You know, people expect us nowadays to be much more succinct than we were. Like, there was a time you'd get away with talking for two or three hours uh, and just rattling on. Um, that's not, you won't get away with that anymore. Preparation, like physical preparation, Emotional preparation, we've just talked briefly about physical preparation is critical. Um, 
Otherwise, you're just going to be white noise. I mean, we're, you know, I don't know what I am to you today. Like, I can be white noise. You know, you'd be gone, you know, out of here in a few minutes and, you know, go off to do something else and so on. We're, we, we can miss each other very easily. I think the point of uh, what Debbie did this morning was, um, it's really powerful for me because what we say isn't always what's there. There's always more there. And we don't want to be missing each other like that. Um, but in these days that we live in now, um, most of the coaches that I work with, when I talk to them privately, they say, um, I don't have time. Um, I'm always on, and I have no thoughts free from work. It's that fast for me. That's what coaches say to me. Uh, and I don't know how long I can hold this sort of level of intensity. You know, life seems to be going very, very quickly for us all. So how do you be succinct? Um, first of all, <laughs> uh, succinct doesn't just mean short. You know, we want to be succinct. Um, we want to finish with people still feeling there was more they could have heard and could have listened to. And there are about seven things in us that tend to fight us being succinct and brief. Uh, and I just want to quickly, you know, talk you through, because you'll be prone to one of these guys. All of you will be prone to one of these. I'm prone to one or two of these. Um, there, you know, this comes from Joseph McCormick's work. Um, sometimes we're not brief. We don't say what we need to say in a sharp, pointed way because we just get confused. We just get carried away with our own sort of, you know, we get confused with our own thinking. We're not clear on what we wanted to say. Sometimes it's callousness. You know, it's, it's literally, I've got the floor. Tough luck, everybody. Suffer, right? Too bad. I've got to be sitting down there someday, now I'm up here, you guys, your turn to listen, like it can be that. Um, sometimes it's complication, that we try, to, we try to be so clever in our heads that we overcomplicate things, and you could be prone to that. And now that I'm standing up in front of people, I've got to be really, really clever, and I've got to have a whole lot of stuff to give them. That's overcomplicated. Sometimes it's, you get overconfident. You know, have I got a story for you? You know, just pull up a chair, guys, and listen. This is going to be fantastic. Like, you know, you, get, you tell the third and the fourth and the fifth story. After the first story was quite good, the second story was, okay, the third story, people say, oh, for God's sake, can you move on? We get that sort of... Uh, sometimes it's cowardice. That's a tricky one for some of us. Um, I don't want to say what I mean, so I'm going to disguise it in lots of other stuff. I'm afraid you won't like what I have to say because it's too provocative. Uh, and so I'm just going to sort of sugarcoat it and disguise it uh, instead of saying... Uh, what I should have said. Sometimes it's that I'm not prepared. I'm too careless to care about that. Um, too bad. I haven't had time. And, and, and sometimes it's that you get too comfortable up in front of the group and you rattle on like, you know, you're sitting at home having a whiskey and, and, and a yarn with some of your mates. So those seven C's tend to sort of, in all of your DNA as a sort of a speaker with impact, you will be prone probably to one of those at your worst. You know, at your best, you'll be magnificent, but at your worst. I was recently at a conference, and they said to me, uh, it was an academic conference, and I was talking about this, and this very, very professorial guy said to me, uh, this is very interesting, Professor Spillane. And I was thinking, oh, I'm not a professor, but that's okay, I'll, I'll take that. He said, um, can you tell me what the hierarchy is? Can you give me those in order? <laughs> Which is the worst, he said. And I said, the worst is the one you're prone to. Like, stop turning it into a theory and actually work on the thing you need to work on. So if you've spotted anything up there, forget the other one, say, I actually get a bit careless when I'm speaking, and that's what minimizes my impact. Or I get a bit too comfortable up there, and that's what minimizes my impact. You know, work on where you're at. You know, I think we get into all these theoretical frameworks, and we get too intellectual about all that sort of stuff. McCormick gives us this little tool, and I think it's a really good one for you to organize your talk. Uh, around, and he says, he just calls it a brief map, and he said, if you're going to try and speak, you're giving a message to your team, you're giving a message, you're, giving, you're talking to a board, whatever it is, he uses the acronym brief, and he said, in the center of this, he said, just write down, what is your key message? What, what am I actually here to say? And then he gets you to go around the other five uh, pieces, he said, what points do you want to make about background or beginning? So how do you start this? And you could put a slide or two outside that and say, I'd use that slide and that slide, because we're often speaking with slides nowadays. Second one is, how am I going to establish relevance, the R? So brief is B-R-I-E-F, so the first one is background, the second one is R for relevance. How do I establish connection or relevance to the group for this? Why does this matter to them? 
So spend a little bit of time early in your talk making sure they see why you're talking about it. Third one, what key information do I have to give people? You know, what, the key in, uh, what I find with a lot of uh, over-analytical coaches is that they want four boxes for key information. The key information box is going to be huge. The relevance ones can sometimes be almost non-existent. And, you know, we just go into that key information stuff. Then, how am I going to close it off? How am I going to bring it to an end? And then finally, what follow-ups do I want people to, what do I want people to take away, and is there any follow-up that I want people to have? It's a beautiful little organizer. It takes you a few minutes. And I would sort of suggest to you, and there's a couple of handouts of that one there, you know, the next time you need to sort of speak in front of a group, just to arrange your thoughts in, in a simpler form. And as that, you may have one of your own. I'm not suggesting this as the only one, but it's a good one. It's one that I use, and I think a practical, helpful thing to sort of keep you succinct and keep you in shape when you're in front of the group. I think our time is up. I was, uh, there is lots more to go on, on this, but I think our time is up. And rather than sort of rush through stuff, I just want to sort of just summarize. What I'm saying is that the two critical pieces of preparation that will give you the best chance of speaking with impact, the first one is to get your own energy and emotions prepared for the speaking occasion. And that takes work. And you need to study yourself, you need to watch yourself, you need to get some good data on that to see what you're prone to do. And the second one I'm saying is simply find a simple way of organizing your thoughts so that you never stand up in front of a group of people uh, and make up your point as you're going along. Uh, you know, you're halfway through, you think, hmm, well, I might as well go there as well and go there as well and go there as well. Um, I haven't really had time in the sort of 45 minutes this morning to talk about uh, that interactivity and why that's important, or connection, but uh, hopefully we've been a little bit interactive and certainly a little bit connected. Uh, and, 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 and I know I'm speaking to people who are very, very good at this already. Take care of yourselves, guys, and uh, thank you very much for, for coming along, and I hope there's something there. If you feel like uh, either of those two handouts are there, if there's only a few of them, because I thought I might have 30 people in front of me today, so uh, if you feel like it, uh, and I will send the slides through, and uh, Brett, somebody will send the slides out to people as well. So best of luck with the rest of the convention, guys, and thanks for the invitation to come and speak to you. Thank you.